I realized how much of the fear, you know, that I was living under, fear of the rapture, fear of being left behind, you know, fear of my mother told me, don't look in your eyes in the mirror because it opens the window to the soul and you'll be, you know, subjected to demon possession. And, you know, I was afraid of being possessed all the time. I couldn't really live on my own. Cassandra, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. How are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I'm excited to speak with you because you have a very interesting story. Um, you had a spontaneous spiritual awakening, but prior to that, you were very religious. So can you just take us back to your childhood and up until when you had that spiritual awakening? Absolutely. Yeah. So I grew up in a religiously abusive home. Um, my mother around when I was in third grade, you know, early elementary, I guess you could say started attending the church. Um, life at home prior to that wasn't so awesome. Um, but it definitely got more complicated with religion. It did not get better. Um, we grew up in a fundamentalist Christian home. Um, I've also, some people refer to this environment sort of like a high control religion. Um, it was very, very controlled. We were very isolated. Um, not only from, you know, even, um, our family members really, but also they, the perspective of my parents was to be very guarded from what we shared even in the church. So we kind of felt like having friends, relationships, anything like that was very difficult and challenging. Um, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of a lot of things that sort of made it complicated <laughs> for me to sort of get just the basic life skills you know i was 18 years old and i actually had another church member um kind of approach me and sort of sow the seeds that where you know what was going on at my home wasn't exactly normal um, you know, my mother calls herself an apostle and since has kind of started her own ministry. Um, so it was, you know, with this conversation, I started to entertain the possibility of things being off. I grew up, my brother, he, he's five years younger than me. He kind of got it quicker than I did. You know, he would always say, you know, Cassandra, why don't you stand up for yourself? Why don't you, you know, speak out? It was, you know, you hear about fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. I was the fawning type, you know, it was just everything to try to people please and make everybody happy. But around the age of 18, with that conversation with these members of the church, I sort of entertained the possibility of a life that looked a little different. Um, my grandfather committed suicide at that same age and Ultimately, my mother kind of blamed that on he wasn't on fire enough for God. So the Lord took his umbrella of protection off and allowed my grandfather, you know, the devil to take his life. That kind of was the last straw for me. Um, and from that point, I decided to move out. Now, I would say um, for much of this time from 18 to mid 20s, I still tried to be involved in the church. Um, it kind of dwindled a little bit over time, but by the age of around 25, 
I kind of had this perspective where I just hoped that I was going to be good enough. I prayed, you know, and I tried to do everything I could. Um, but I wasn't as involved into the church, but I still, my life was greatly influenced by that fear. And also I'm realizing now, even those undertones of that judgmental fundamentalist perspective of outsiders, um, that, you know, didn't share the same belief systems that, you know, I felt kind of controlled my life. I did not expect a spiritual awakening. Sadly, I went most of my life just kind of um, battling the fear that was kind of bred into me as a child. It wasn't until I was 41 years old that I had my spiritual awakening, which was within the last few years. And it was not something I was looking for. Um, I did not really entertain any sort of, you know, of this stuff at the, t you know, at the time would have felt like, you know, that's demonic or of the devil or, you know, um, so I wasn't expecting it. It just was something that happened overnight. Um, and in sharing my story, I've, I'm told it's a little peculiar in the sense of there wasn't a major death in the family or any tragedy that inspired it. Um, later on, I realized that when it happened, it was actually on a solar eclipse, which holds a significant placement in my astrology chart. And so it was like I went to bed one way, woke up uh, a total different person. I was speaking, understanding things that, you know, like I had been studying them for years. <laughs> wow, Cassandra, that is so fascinating. That story is so interesting. There's so many elements there, right? One, when you say abusive, when you say you grew up in an abusive yeah. household, was it that they were so strict with what you had to believe, right? Because you grew up, um, your church was a fundamentalist church, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So were they so strict about what you had to believe that if you veered from that, there would be repercussions? Is that what you mean by abuse? That's a very good question. So how I term it is, you know, I assume, um, you know, my story I see does not define everybody. And I believe there are people that, um, you know, can be in different church type environments and it possibly be good for them. I, I define it as anytime you're using religion for personal purposes, um, anytime you're taking what is, let's be honest, already fundamentalists, you know, it's, it's complicated enough as it is. But on top of that, um, my parents were were not exactly the most healthy people. So when I say religiously abusive, they used religion as a tool to control myself and my brother in ways beyond what I would define as, you know, specific to our church experience. For example, um, I was my relationship with my mother. Anytime I tried to have any relationships, um, it was always the Lord told me they're not right for you. The Lord told me, you know, this, it was this sense of, I was not the authority or had any authority over kind of making those decisions for myself. Another circumstance is that my mother attempted in my earlier preteen years, early teen years, um, to cast out a spirit of lust out of me. And mm. it was so traumatizing. I was, it was hours long. And I can remember I was just curled in a ball and crying. And my mother was shouting at me, tell me your name, demon, tell me your name, demon. And I can remember just feeling like I didn't know I was possessed. I didn't want to be possessed. I mean, I was a people pleaser. I wanted to do everything right. How could I be in this situation? 
And I remember sitting there thinking, what did I do? How can I get this demon to speak through me? You know, what do I do to be free? And ultimately my mother said that I did not want to be free of my demons. So I would have to just live with them. So there were situations in which religion was used in abusive ways to really control um, the narrative of what my brother and I experienced. Thank you for sharing that. And it's so interesting because I do think that religion does serve a purpose if it is used as a way of connecting to other people. I think at the core of most religions, is this idea of love and unity, right? But then you have human beings who come in and corrupt it. And that happens a lot of times where people use religion as fear mongering or control tactics to keep people in line with their own personal agenda or to kind of, again, control them, right? So everything that you're talking about is so similar to what a lot of people use religion for. I'm curious, what type of beliefs did fundamentalists have? So, um, you know, it was it was very particular in, um, you know, it was defined, you know, the world we lived in and secular. So music outside music wasn't OK. Television wasn't OK. Non-believers, people that didn't have the same belief as you weren't OK. I was raised in purity culture. So all of that applied, you know, to where you, you know, you were taught to refrain from any sort of sexual connection to yourself or to others. Um, we weren't allowed attending sex ed in school because, you know, that was of the devil. Uh, didn't believe in dinosaurs because there's no dinosaurs in the Bible. Um, there was just all these things that just went against, you know, so much else. And, you know, the other thing is there's this element of that patriarchy feel to it. Um, And that was something I didn't even realize how deeply was rooted until I got married. My husband was an authority over me. My husband made the final decision. I wasn't adequate enough to make decisions. You know, it's this system that sort of puts the power in, especially for women, in the hands of somebody else you know whether that be the ministers the pastors your husband you know other male figures you know and so um but we did in general religiously speaking you know believe in jesus jesus is coming and dying you know for our sins and needing to accept him into our life speaking in tongues slain in the spirit you know, prophesying, all of that was part of what was regularly, I was regularly experiencing. Wow. Okay. So you're being heavily programmed to have these certain beliefs. You are essentially being told that there's something wrong with you because you have a demon in you and your mom's trying to cast out the demon, but that was unsuccessful, right? So you're living in a state of fear, whether you're aware of it or not all the time. So At 18, you decide to leave home. That was when the seed was planted for you that, hey, maybe something's wrong here. Yeah. But you were still a part of the church. You were still part of the religion. And then almost two decades later, at 41, you had this spontaneous awakening. And by the time you had the spontaneous awakening, were you still part of the church or had you stopped being a part of the church by then, but you just still hadn't had an awakening. Yeah, I would say that by 25, I was, I, we weren't actively participating towards the end. We did more like prayer groups, my husband and I, and we kind of liked the community, smaller organizations, bigger, better than the bigger, um, churches and the politics involved with it and so i kind of used that as oh you know 
um, I'm a Christian and I know better, but the church has it all wrong, you know, and I kind of use that to kind of help me sleep at night, I guess you could say, you know, um, so I was still very much believing in, you know, but there was always, even at that, there was always just no matter how active or inactive, it just never felt good enough. So there was always that fear. Right. Okay. So when you had your spiritual awakening, could you describe what you awakened to, right? Because people say they had a spiritual awakening and for everyone that looks different, right? Maybe someone realizes that, you know, only one God is exists or multiple gods exist. However you want to call them, just giving like an arbitrary analogy here. What exactly was your spiritual awakening? What did you wake up or realize? So it started off with um, astrology. It was, I was listening to something and, you know, it was like that door was open and I was listening to something and it just, all of a sudden, it was like, I understood it. I just, I don't, you know, and I've, I've talked to my husband and joked that I wish I could be a fly on the wall to replay that day again, because it was just almost indescribable. Um, but it was just this, this, it just clicked and I was understanding things and speaking language, like I said, and I mean, especially for someone that's brand new, never entertained reading a natal chart or astrology, you know, it's not something that generally you just kind of get it so quickly. Um, so that was that day, like that day, by the end of that evening, I told my husband, I was like, this, this is my, the whole recipe of my life. And I just sobbed because I was so frustrated that I didn't know it sooner. Um, and I mean, I had people around me that talked about this stuff and it just, it, I, I never, I never allowed myself that liberty because it was wrong. You know, that's what I was taught. And so the next day I saw friends that, you know, and also my husband, they were like, you're a different person like you are absolutely you feel different you act different you speak different like you just are completely a different individual than where you were and from there i had to deconstruct my religious beliefs so it was like i and that's the thing when you experience something that's so unexplainable it's like you know, you almost have to question like, what, what is this? What is God? What is what just happened? You know, why would I have this experience and it would be for God, you know, so it was like, I had to go through um, and start like a deconstruction process. And the first thing I can remember feeling amazed by is how naive I was in my upbringing. And I always kind of thought, you know, in the beginning there was God and he created the heavens and earth and there there's where we start. So, you know, I guess if he started it and Christianity's the beginning, then sure, I guess everything that comes after it has to be false gods, like I was taught. And so when I discovered there was like 2000 years of like, you know, Hinduism and Buddhists and all of these belief systems that came like so much further along than Christianity. Christianity was like the new guy on the block, you know? And so I was like, whoa, wait a minute. How could I have not known this? And it just spiraled from there. Yeah. It's funny that you you mentioned that because ever since I was younger, I just remember thinking, you know, I grew up Christian as well. I grew up Catholic. Um, I, I was still identify as a Christian, but I just remember thinking I'm a Christian, but I know this person who's Muslim. Yeah. I know this person who's Hindu, who's correct, because at least how I was raised, it was like Christianity is the one and truest path to God. 
And I was like, I'm sure other religions think their way is the highest path to God. So I was always just very skeptical about that notion. So it's interesting that you brought that up in your awakening when you realized like, okay, there are all these other spiritual practices, religious practices. And I thought Christianity or the way I was doing it was the one true way. Again, everybody's journey is different, right? It's all about what works for you. But I find that very interesting that you had that experience. And where was there a part of you at all that was kind of scared where it's like, okay, something in me has switched, right? I've literally, no pun intended, shifted dimensions, you know, (laughs) entered a new reality. Like I have a new perspective. Was there a part of you that was scared what's going to happen with me and my husband or what's going to happen with my friends? They know me a certain way. We have certain beliefs. Now I'm completely veering off of that. Mm, Such a good question. I love it. So what's so interesting about it is I joke that, you know, they talk about there being certain steps of spiritual awakening. And it's like the first stage I feel like is like you feel like you're a kid in a candy shop. It's like full of magical rainbows and possibilities and fairies and like all the sugar plums and, you know, everything magical is suddenly possible perhaps you know and i think part of the reason it's like that is to kind of just really ground you in on what you're about to go through because that phase is only the beginning so in the beginning i felt incredible and the biggest thing was that i felt like i finally had permission to learn and discover who I was. And I realized how much of the fear, you know, that I was living under, fear of the rapture, fear of being left behind, you know, fear of my mother told me, don't look in your eyes in the mirror because it opens the window to the soul and you'll be, you know, subjected to demon possession. And, you know, I was afraid of being possessed all the time. I couldn't really live on my own well. And all of these fears, all of a sudden, I life felt like it wasn't so threatening. Not only that, but instead of feeling like I was so unworthy, I mean, I lived my life before for feeling like someone that people just had to tolerate. You know, everybody else was the authority over me and I wasn't getting it right. And so why would they want to, you know, be a part of my life? And so there was all of that gunk that melted away and it became this magical spiritual awakening and self-discovery journey and i felt like i just started to blossom as an individual and really come to terms with who i was and then that's when all the you know the dark night of the soul they call it and you know yeah you i my husband and i've been married 20 years um it completely shifted the dynamic of our entire relationship he was always the authority the one that carried me the one that emotionally made me stable you know so now all of that shifted and he's seeing me build confidence and speaking up and getting in touch with my needs and who i am and you know that had to shift that relationship because he felt like do you need me now what is my purpose i had taken up so much space that it was a hard shift for him um and i did i lost the majority of my relationships um sadly even two of them that were spiritual they did not stick around for my entire journey so yeah Yeah, that's a lot. I think that's why a lot of people say that they're scared to come out of the spiritual closet, quote unquote. And 
is that what brought you towards your dark night of the soul and kind of doing a lot of what people might consider shadow work? Because it is kind of painful to lose connections, even though like you're stepping into a new version of yourself because of that spiritual awakening. Now you're stepping into your power. Now you're working to understand who you are, because I heard something that you said on a different podcast is that you really didn't have a sense of self, right? And you Correct. didn't have, you weren't in touch with your intuition. You weren't in touch with your own needs and desires. And here you are now self-actualizing. And while the people in your life might love and care about you, it's a completely different version of who you are. So they're also contending with that. So how did you work through that emotionally? I know that must have been tough. So yeah, as far as shadow work, I'd say that I started to the first steps of that journey with, because uh, I'm big on shadow work. I mean, uh, meditation and self-reflection this whole time um, has been such a amazing tool in my journey. Even before my awakening, I, I was in therapy for three years before my awakening. My husband and I almost got a divorce, you know, and that was kind of helped me through some of my mental state, but there was so much left to, to heal and unpack. Could we just, for the listeners who might not know, I think shadow work is like this buzzword now online. Can we just briefly define if you could put into words what shadow work is? Absolutely, absolutely. So now there are a lot of different definitions uh, out there. This is how I defined it. I don't necessarily say shadow work is just 100% bad. It's like the terrible side of you. I look at it more as it's the unconscious or the subconscious side of you. And it's the side that kind of, I look at it as the friend that kind of is like tapping you, hey, notice me notice me can can we talk um it's the part of us that wants our attention now because it's subconscious a lot of times it is associated with lower vibrational things the things that we do that are coming from you know those traumas like i shared with my childhood those experiences that cause us to be and act certain ways to think different ways that are so we're not sure why you know they just are a natural so you could say trauma response or a natural part of us until we sit with them and we address them and this isn't a matter of i need to fix myself so i'm perfect and i never have to deal with you know this that or the other thing again i personally am a firm believer that we live on this on this earth experience with polarity the yin and the yang and the yin and the yang must be balanced and so i look at shadow work as that aspect of us that is calling for our attention often because it's things we haven't worked through they can be lower vibrational um, energy that you know we express so shadow work is sitting with ourselves and when you go through something and you experience something to care about how you feel to care about that moment and instead of doing what you know so much in the society we live in is external reflection blame putting it on other people instead it's asking you to sit and think about how does this specifically affect you and to say to yourself you know i care about how i want to feel now how what is going on under the surface you know sometimes you can just it's easy to say well that person hurt me and you know but there's a deeper re reason and lining behind that and we can't control the external world so the more we can understand ourselves and what's triggering these responses the more we can heal from that and be able to be more integrated really into life i i mean i am a firm believer that when we are on a spiritual path 
you know, it's, I know there's buzzwords and means about, oh, I've healed so much. I can't tolerate anybody around me, you know, and I personally believe that when we are truly healing ourselves and integrating, we actually can handle what's going on externally in the world because we are very self-aware of ourselves and what's causing that. Beautifully said. I think the the higher you get in your spiritual journey, I do agree with you. It's not like you want to be around people who don't respect your boundaries, yeah. but there's a certain level of grace you develop because as you do your work, especially confronting the shadow or the aspects of your personality that are challenging, the more you do that, and you do it well, you actually build compassion for yourself and you're able to build compassion for other people. Cause you're like, oh wait, a lot of these things I'm I'm scared about, I'm scared of, or I have shame around this. I'm not in that person's head and I don't wanna, you know, make an excuse for bad behavior for this other person in my life, but I wonder what their shadow is, right? Yeah. And you you just extend more grace and you're a lot more tolerant not tolerating bad behavior or necessarily wanting to fix them, but you can extend grace. And I think that tolerance is that grace that you're talking about. Very well said. Very yeah. well said. Yeah. And I think that that understanding is what ultimately helped me in the long run of those relationships. Because once I did go through that work for myself, I started to understand how, you know, why I was a simple example was I realized that I got really upset when people complimented me and I would start feeling panicky and I would withdraw. And my husband brought it to my attention one day and I couldn't even have the conversation with him. And then I realized, okay, there's a shadow. So I sat down, I self-reflected and over a week, sometimes that's the thing with shadow work. It, you know, sometimes it's not immediately, sometimes, it reveals itself. But that's the thing. As long as you're spending that time and inviting the universe or God source, whatever, you know, you feel comfortable with, you're allowing that opening for them to speak with you. They'll show you. And so for a week, I started to realize it, I became very consciously aware of these behavior patterns. And what I found out was I was raised in a very manipulative home and it was my responsibility responsibility to make people happy. So when a compliment was given generally to me, it was like either a kind of like an undertone of criticizing me in some way to try to shift my behavior, um, or it was because they wanted something. So there was that part of me internally that felt like compliments weren't safe. They were, they were threatening. And so going through shadow work helped me realize that. And ultimately, as I became more self-aware, when those relationships went, uh, went away, I'm not going to say it was easy, but where I landed was that with each one of them, I knew that I equally you know, contributed gifts, positivity, and probably triggered just like they did to me. And that it can't all be wrapped up and summed in one box of this was a bad relationship, you know? And I understand that those relationships are there for a reason and they help us on our journeys to heal and evolve. Beautiful, beautifully said there. So if you don't mind me asking, are you still on talking terms with your mom? Oh, so my mom, um, and this is a funny story because I believe ultimately where we are now was destined to happen. And that is that I was disowned a year prior to my spiritual awakening. The interesting part is I mentioned earlier, my husband and I going to therapy to try to resolve our marriage. Um, 
I had confided in my parents. Uh, I, you know, the funny thing is, I think that. So I'll be blunt. I, I was unfaithful in my marriage, and I think that when you are in a position you're not healthy, um, you tend to seek out the people that you think are going to give you. It's like your trauma plays off of their trauma, and I know their desire to control me would give me the attention and the affirmation I needed to feel like it was okay. And it later bit me in the butt because when I went to therapy, they wanted to know, you know, what did you talk about? What was going on? And, and they, you, I, I couldn't, every time I would try to keep information away, it caused big extreme outbursts. So I ultimately asked them for space, which got me disowned for Mm. three years. And then we tried to work it out for 12 years. And then a year before my awakening, um, they disowned me. And there's a lot more to that. But generally speaking, I feel like, and I know from my own um, practice of understanding past lives, that this was sort of a karmic um, journey that was played out and and intended, agreed upon to bring me to where I am now. Wow. Well, I'm sorry to hear that because I know that it's obviously a complicated history and story with your family, but it's still not, I mean, I can't speak for you, but I can only assume that it's still hard to feel like you're disowned or shunned from your family. So that is tough, but it's interesting that you brought up karma because I do want to talk about that, right? Because now that you have the spiritual awakening, you're really not shy about getting into all of the different types of, you know, metaphysical topics, especially now that you're a human design reader. Um, And I want to talk about all of that, but I really want to ask, what is your relationship with God now? Or do you refer to God as God or source? How do you view God? That's a really good question. So I do believe in, um, you know, I often refer to it as God, um, but I also refer to it as universe and source as well. So I've kind of, um, you know, what's funny about it really is regardless of the title, I see it more as the feeling. The feeling of what I wanted with religion was that feeling of, you know, you're told God the Father, you know, and you're, you just tend to, you know, often want to equate it to that person that there is that element of that religion before it's corrupted, (laughs) you know, that's like, you're cared for, you're loved, you're a child of God, you're, you know, all of these things that make you feel supported, protected and looked after. But I never really felt that in my upbringing with my mother, the focus was always the devil and the demons and possession, you know, and all of that, where when I went through my deconstruction process, where I came back is regardless of what title I give it, that essence of there is this essence of universal love support that is guiding and directing and influencing my life that is ever present. And not only that, but is so much more loving than I ever imagined could possibly be. There has been so so many dots connected in tender love and care through my shadow work and healing journey that I've felt more of a connection to God's source, um, if you will, than I, I ever thought. So in that way, um, you know, yes, I do. I also do believe in Jesus. I just think that in my personal perspective, that there, the patriarchy of man and the desire to control has kind of tainted and influenced the mesh, the message there. I kind of tend to see Jesus more of like an ascended master. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, that's kind of where I landed. You know, it's interesting that you say that about Jesus. I hear people say that the similar thing, that they see Jesus as an ascended master. But I I don't understand 
what that means. I've heard it so many times. What is an ascended master? So an ascended master basically would be the ultimate, um, the ultimate achievement of ascension or perfect balanced unity of basically where we're all meant to kind of be gravitating, you know, towards. I talked about earlier that balance of yin and yang. It's that it's lo- it's oh, it's so love fueled you know it's this compassion it's this understanding of who you are understanding i am a child of god you know we are part of the god source you know not being exclu- you know religiously exclusive controlling but rather genuine heartfelt love and balance compassion understanding and connection um he was that example that is how i see it there are many other ascended masters uh buddha would be another one um and so you know it's this idea that it's the ultimate highest expression of the most balanced enlightened perspective of why we're here really the whole essence of everything Thank you for explaining that. That makes a lot of sense. I, I, like I said, I hear people use that a lot and I was able to kind of, you know, figure out what the definition of an ascendant master could be, but I've never explicitly researched it or asked someone to explain it. So thank you for that. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and go back to what you were talking about regarding past lives and karma because that's a very interesting topic for me. I love all things reincarnation because I just think, whether it's true or not, I really like the concept of it. And I do want to say that I do believe that there's more truth to it than not, right? So as you're on this journey, right, how did you stumble upon reincarnation? And what are your thoughts on that? And how does that apply to karma? So when I started going through my deconstruction process, I didn't even have to give a second thought on reincarnation. Like Mm. I immediately, it just was like a part of me new. And it was funny because I had, I have a very, very, you know, a friend who's been with me for a very, very long time. And when her and I first met, she believed in reincarnation. And I can remember at the time feeling like I thought it was the most ridiculous thing. And, you know, I was so, I was still so programmed by that religious perspective that's very condemning um, and controlling. And so I, you know, but when I had my awakening, that was immediate. um, And actually I've written a book that I'm in the process of being uh, getting published and part of that I share my deconstruction process and I share that yeah reincarnation was just something that I felt like I instantly it just was like a part of me almost like it was just that deep of a knowing and it has been such a important key in my understanding and perspective and ability to relate and heal, you know, because I look at it this way. And, you know, the example I like to give is this is when we have something that is done to us, one of the first things we want to do is, of course, unfortunately, blame, you know, or look externally. But generally, one of the next things we want to do fairly quickly is we want to know, why did they do that to me? Like, we want to know what, why. And, you know, I look at it as reincarnation for one is the perfect expression of that, you know, and, and yes, I do believe it's all part of our elevating consciousness, but how is that consciousness elevated? through experiencing itself. That is why we split off from source God, you know, in the first place is that experiencing oneself. And so when we have these things done to us, I believe that we want to experience what that is. So, you know, someone who might wrong me in this life, I might say, why, you know, and my soul might 
gum at the end of it and be like, you know, I still am really thinking about that. Why, you know, that they did that. And so then I choose to incarnate. And then the next time, guess what? I'm the bad guy, you know, and I'm experiencing that. I'm experiencing the guilt of that, the shame of that, like all the things that are tied into being a part of that. And now my soul has this complete picture, you know, 360 degrees of every aspect of what that circumstance felt like. And with that is wisdom and understanding and clarity. We understand, we can see, and if we can understand, we can course correct and we can know better and we can learn from it. But sadly, sometimes it takes those mistakes that, you know, for us to learn and grow. So I believe a lot about reincarnation is contracted agreements of souls who choose to participate in the movie that they play out. You know, we all are players in pieces in this, you know, this thing that we wanted, this play we wanted to experience and pull together. So that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, it's very interesting stuff. I think if I'm understanding correctly, so I guess if we are reincarnating and we're choosing to have certain experiences because part of being human is to have certain experiences and evolve and grow, then that means some of the contracts that we're making are karmic contracts? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Because people tend to think of karma as, well, if you hit me, then somebody else is going to hit you. And some, and what I'm learning is that karma is not as straightforward yeah. as people think it is. Maybe that is an element of it, but I would say at the core of karma is to help you evolve and also kind of understand how you affect other people. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so like in your example of, you know, um, hitting or whatever, I, I think that, uh, I mean, also we can factor in law of attraction to that, yeah. <laughs> which then we're getting a little more deeper, but generally speaking, you very well you know, state of that. Yes, absolutely. That it is more, it's not so much about, you know, do this, do that. It's, it is more, you know, there's a lot more to it. And I love how you um, emphasize the point of healing and evolving and learning and growing. Yeah. yeah. Because a lot of what you were saying in your story about how you feel like you and your mom kind of made a contract and that was, set in stone so that you can have this evolution, you can have the spiritual awakening. I just thought about certain experiences that I had in my life that were really painful. And I just remember thinking like, I'm a good person. I don't deserve this. But then, you know, that was kind of being in a victim mindset, even though my feelings, I would still say are kind of valid because, you know, when you're going through something painful, you're just kind of like, well, why is this happening to me? But as I did the work and I did a lot of introspective work, I was like, oh my God, I'm literally participating in creating this dynamic because I'm supposed to learn this. Like I'm an active participant, even though I'm not aware, but I'm supposed to learn that I need to set boundaries. I'm supposed to learn to trust my intuition. And in order for me to get there, I actually have to engage in this dynamic to wake me up because I think yeah. a lot of life is waking up and we tend to wake up most of the time through the relationships that we have oh yeah yeah I yeah I definitely think that the our relationships are like the precise ingredients for the karma and the yeah. evolution that we're meant to go through and I love also with what you shared you know and talking about that journey because I think whether it's karma or you know I know a lot of people talk about the topic of manifestation nowadays you know I think that often as humans we kind of think that we just want to snap our fingers and be there you know and and you're right in that it, how you shared that journey and your ability to reflect on saying like, you know, you're for, you went from first saying, oh, I'm a good person. Why is this? But then realizing the necessity of it to get there. And that's the thing is that 
if we just snapped our fingers and jumped from here to there and never had, like I said, that yin yang balance of polarity, we wouldn't learn those lessons, but look at how much stronger, you know, and the tool, I'm sure you can tell me all sorts of things you learned from those experiences that strengthen you and made you who you are now. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, it's it's brought me here to having this conversation with you, not to be dramatic, right? But <laughs> this is one of the byproduct, one of the yeah. byproducts of, you know, going through that whole journey. And yeah. it's interesting, part of what has brought me into podcasting today and doing what I do now, the first seed that planted that was human design. So- oh! Yes, yes, it was. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about your journey and now you're a human design. You do a lot of things, actually. You have a long history of entrepreneurship, but right now you're a human design reader. And I think you're a gene key guide. And I, I yes. do want to talk about that because I've never heard of gene key guide. But let's just focus on human design first. One, what is human design and how did you get on that path? Yeah, awesome. So I shared at the beginning of my spiritual awakening, a lot of it had to do with astrology. And so there was this one particular astrologer that I followed and she was in human design or getting just getting in human design. And it was one of those things where, you know, I was like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of here, you know, I was still real new to everything. The human design piece was the first time I realized that if the universe wants you to pursue a path, it's going to keep putting it in front of you. And so I kept like, nah, nah, you know, um, and it just kept coming back. And finally I was like, okay, fine. I'm going to pull up my chart. And I love that you mentioned you you know are familiar because a lot of people when they first pull their chart up a lot of them are overwhelmed they're like oh my gosh what does this mean and it just was like i mean i was totally one of those emojis with like heart eyes just like popping out and i was like you know and it's just like lines and shapes but i mean i was just like Oh, I was in love. And so I booked the session, which it took a few, it took a little while to get the actual session. By the time I got to the session, I had already kind of absorbed the like more than what we were going to talk about. So she kind of just went and shared more astrology stuff. Um, so from there, I just kept learning more and learning more. And so what human design is, is I describe it as, you know, we can look at the formal definition of it being that it uses a variety of different ancient modalities, you know, um, and more modern sciences, you know, it uses a lot of astrology, the I Ching, Kabbalah tree of life, Hindu chakra system, and then it gets into things like circuitry and quantum physics and, you know, all of these things. And you can say it kind of just puts them in a bowl, mixes them all up and pops out a human design chart. Um, so I like to describe it as not just only human design, but really anything, astrology, you know, numerology, anything that is using your birthday information I, I describe it as your light signature. And this was a term used by Robert Edward Grant, whom I absolutely adore. And it's, it's, it's our essence, you know, you could say blueprint, um, but it's, it's the, it's, it's who we are. And so these different modalities, gene keys, human design, you know, astrology, they're reading this blueprint. And so human design helps us to, you know, get in touch with the essence of who we are. And I love it because for every aspect of human design, there's sort of this polarity of gift potential and shadow expression. And then the shadow has a repressive or a reactive side. And it's a way for us to look. And I see as 
being able to measure in a sense of, you know, get a, get a read on where we're at, like, how are we doing, you know, and we talked earlier about shadow work, you know, you can kind of figure out, you know, different aspects of challenging areas in your life. And, you know, a good reader will be able to say, oh, yep, there, there's, you know, this, you know, number or that, um, and help you to, sometimes it's easier when you can do that because then you can look at it and you can fixate or focus on what that expression particular expression is and then you have somewhere to kind of feel and work your way through i definitely look at human design as a tool of empowerment um i know you know there's of course with anything you're gonna have uh different perspectives and some of the original older um, human design readers tend to follow more dogmatic, original, raw, the founder, um, a lot of language of not self and, um, you know, limitations, but ultimately the chart I feel is quantum. I love Karen Curry Parker talks about human design being very quantum and it's a tool to help us evolve and grow. Yeah, I love what you said there that human design is a tool for self empowerment because, you know, I, we've all heard about astrology, I need to go a lot deeper into astrology, I think I know the surface level I think I know, like I know my sun sign I know my moon and I know my rising. Um, but I haven't really done like a whole deep dive into the it's chart. A lot. It's, it's a, a lot. lot. It's overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So with human design, I kind of felt at least, again, I haven't done a deep dive into it, but I did have a reading a couple of years ago and I just kind of thought, okay, this is the first thing I'm hearing that sounds very affirming. And it makes me feel like, oh, okay, I'm not crazy because sometimes with astrology, there's so much that the sun sign, your sun sign doesn't really tell you anything because I could wake up today and read something about, I'm a Libra. I could wake up today and read something about a Libra and then wake up tomorrow and read something about a Taurus. And it sounds, I sound like both of those things, right? So, I mean, granted, that's very general. That's a lot yeah. of the stuff we see online. It's extremely general. This is not me coming for astrology, but I just kind of felt like human design just seemed like oh okay well this is seems a bit more straightforward and very empowering so I know that there are different types of human design so can you talk a little bit about the different types of human design yeah sure um so now I do want to touch on that note there of okay. what you said because that is a really good point and actually partly why I ended up certifying certifying in human design because while I love astrology I can talk to you about astrology and use words like aspects and conjunct and this and that and it's like if you don't know what I'm talking about it's very much more like going I mean I'm I I recognize myself as an intuitive a psychic but you could look at it almost as like going to it a psychic and they're saying oh you know you this or that you know you kind of just are going with yeah. it okay yeah you know where I can talk an hour about human design and people feel empowered they feel like they're going home with a tool in their hands that is easier for them to follow through and continue to study and learn and it's more um it's not as um intuitively you could say red you know because in astrology each one of those signs houses aspects has a number of different you know possible options that kind of fall under them so i could describe you in a leave as a libra in one way you know but that's socially more known but yeah when i describe it in the full extent of libra it could sound like something totally new and different and what words apply to you are going to be unique to you where human design kind of gives you a little more of a meat I would say um, to kind of build and work with. So I, that was absolutely, I 100% agree with some of the things that you were sharing. So now in human design, 
there are five different human design energy types. Um, so this is, you know, I can see how you would call it as such because it is very essential and important. Um, one of the first things to learn and study. Uh, so with human design, the most important part is your energy type and there are five different types. Um, and these all the energy types kind of help describe the essence of like who you are in the world, like what you're contributing in the collective sense, what what part you're playing in that vision. And so we can start off by the most common are generators and manifesting generators. Um, they make up together about 70% of the population. And these are people who have a lot Lot, you know, a lot of energy. Um, they have this essence of them when they're following what lights them up, inspires curiosity. They have a lot of go go power, you know, they can really get things accomplished. Um, with the generator, they are they tend to gravitate towards more of a path of mastery or wanting to move towards a path of mastery. So when a generator follows what lights them up and kind of gets plugged in to their area of interest, they might continue to build in that, you know, general area or vicinity of what their interest is. Um, now for a manifesting generator, they act like a generator, but they have an additional piece um, as a manifester, um, which I'll describe in a moment. But basically one of the key differences between the both because they do both behave very similar the manifesting generator is like the energizer bunny they have um they're very quick they have an express way of doing things which tends to be selective um, so like if you say you want to get something accomplished and you're like, these are all the steps, the manifesting generator is like, nope, I need this step, this step, this step, and I'll get it done without the rest of these four steps. Um, but because of that, because we're fast, a lot of, I say we, because I'm a manifesting generator, um, because we're so fast, sometimes we'll miss steps and have to go back and sort of correct. Another difference is, is that we are not not meant to be linear, where the uh, generator may be a little more possibly linear, the manifesting generator will look like they're kind of just bouncing around, bouncing around. But then later in life, all of those pieces of the puzzle they collected will come together and formulate a full picture. Um, so that's their energy. The manifester is only 9% of the population. If they do not have the same energy centers, the sacral, which is what the generator and manifesting generator have defined. That is why they are such energy types. The manifester does not have the sacral defined, but they do have the throat defined. And so their energy is a little different. They aren't as consistently energetic, but they get powerful burst and spurts forward. And in our history, these were the people that, you know, got things accomplished through questioning standards and authority figures. They're kind of here to make waves and shake things up. And that's very much in alignment for them. Um, their energy kind of gets goes up and then they kind of come down. Uh, next, we have projectors, which are about 20% of the population. And these are our guides. These are the individuals that have that unique bird's eye perspective. You can present a, gener uh, a projector with an idea and they can make it more effic efficient, make it, you know, bring in more money, organize it. You know, they're like the, the uh, project managers in the sense of being able to kind of really pull things together. They have more limited energy. They don't have the up and down spurts like the manifestors, but rather they're, they're meant to be more conscientious of how they spend their energy. They're not gonna want really long days. It's very in a line for them to take naps, you know, and they're just very efficient. 
Um, so they also have a talent for spotting what other people are good at and plugging the right people in the right place. Um, you know, they say the future CEO would be the projector because they're not as masculine yang driven. They're more balanced yin flow and have an eye in spotting the talents of others and bringing in collaboration in that sense. Um, and then the last is the most rare is the reflector and the reflector has no none of the energy centers defined. This is about one to two percent of the population and these are our mirrors, these are the people that also. Um, at their most aligned expression are the most connected to ancestral roots of Mother Gaia, of nature. You know, they can be very grounded individuals um, that are very wise and intelligent. Um, so they are people that if you spend time with, you'll get a good reflection of how you're doing in life, where, you know, where things are landing. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're about, like I said, one to 2% of the population. Very interesting. I remember when I first heard about human design and I was listening to a podcast. I don't know if you know, Erin Claire Jones, she's another human design reader and she broke the whole thing down and I just thought I was like oh I kind of sound like a projector and then upon further research and also getting a reading I'm a manifesting generator which also makes a lot of sense <laughs> so when you said that when I was going through your profile right and yeah. I saw like the different jobs and businesses that you had I'm like oh god she's a manifesting generator right there like <laughs> I see her we're like eye to eye so I'm a manifesting generator I'm a 5-2 manifesting generator I don't really know what the 5-2 means anymore because the reading has been a few years now but it's very interesting like you said I think another reason why I like it is because it kind of gives you a sense of how you operate in the world for a long yeah. time I think the world builds everybody up to feel like they should be a generator. So yeah. I was like, I have all these different passions. Some people say like, I'm going to grow up and be a lawyer and they stick with that path. And yeah. it's like, I had this immense pressure to be like, okay, Jimmy, find what you like and stick to it. But I literally couldn't. So I used to be yeah. so hard on myself and I used to be like, oh, I'm not organized. I'm this, I'm that, I'm not focused. It was... God, that was a lot. I mean, I'm nowhere, I'm not there anymore, but I used to be so hard on myself. So stumble upon, stumbling upon human design made me realize like, oh, I'm not crazy. This is yeah. my design, you know? <laughs> so, uh-huh. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. And that's exactly, that was my piece. That was my biggest first piece too. Same. It's like, I always felt inferior. Like I had to be something that, you know, wasn't, working in my life and yeah realizing oh I get to just play with life I get to yes. taste test things I get to like allow myself to go and flow with wherever I'm led and there's a reason and who cares if that person is like oh I thought you were doing this you're not you're doing that oh okay you know <laughs> just letting that go yeah releasing <laughs> that and you're right I think what you said that I really love and I hope to see as you know life goes on is that you know all the the different interests at some point kind of come together and I'm hoping that that's the case but it really is nice being a manifesting generator it's nice knowing that I am because now I can give myself the freedom to really just be myself without feeling any sort of shame or hang-ups about it so yeah I I love human design and Something else I've heard in the human design community is this whole idea of gene keys. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about that. So could you please, first of all, d define what a gene key is and how does it relate to human design? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I love the Gene Keys. Um, I I look at it a simply state, you know, uh, human design can be a little more of a masculine expression, a yang expression, um, where I feel like Gene Keys is like the esoteric yin expression of it. And so basically what Gene Keys is, is it was founded by Richard Rudd, who studied with and was very much a part of human design originally with Ra Ruhu. And he ended up having his own um, download, I guess you could say, of information that he introduced to the world. At the most basic level, you could say that gene keys are the gates in human design, which are also called hexagrams and the I Ching. And these are brought together and Richard Rudd has shared a what he calls different expressions of each of these gates so there is a gift which um you know a shadow gift in city so the shadow is the lowest expression the gift is a higher expression and the city is the most enlightened expression of that energy so when we look at different gates in the human design that are one through 64 there are a shadow gift and city of each of those. And this basically in human design, when you're studying these gates, you might have like a short paragraph. Most of the time, it's only a couple sentences where Richard Rudd has this entire book that's like this thick. <laughs> so it's like you're getting pages of information that he's sharing on each of these gates. And one of the things I love is I love the I Ching, I love human design and I love Gene Keys. So I like to sort of synthesize and kind of bring all of these together um, to really understand the various elements um, of each expression. Going a step further, he has brought, uh, Richard Rudd has shared what he calls the golden path. So you can pull your uh, Gene Keys chart, which is going to look totally different than the human design chart. However, the aspects that are shared in it are some, not all but some of the same placements that you'll find in your human design chart. So they're very much intertwined together. Um, and the golden path is consists of right now three different paths. It's the activation sequence, which is exploring what in human design would be your incarnation cross. It's the unconscious and conscious sun and earth signs on both on um, both your um you know astrology at birth and astrology three months prior to birth and this is the four pillars of the essence of who you are and then moving from there is the venus sequence and this is where you get into all of the relationship and karma stuff um and start healing what he calls it's a wound map. And so it shares different aspects that are wounding that takes place through various ages of your life. Um, and it helps you to do that self-reflection, that shadow work and understand these aspects of yourself and how they're playing out um, in your life. And then the last would be the pearl sequence, which is all about sort of prosperity in the sense of life fulfillment and you know how everything just comes together for that rich sense of fulfillment at the end when you're kind of following your right purpose so yeah hey that's very interesting you're gonna make me do a deep dive into all of that after this conversation so if i could simplify this as much as possible yeah. And with an analogy. So I would, is it accurate to say like human design is kind of how people perceive you in the world? Of course, there's some stuff that comes up in your internal world that manifests in your external world, but just for the basis of this analogy. So if human design is kind of how you act in the world, would gene keys be kind of 
your internal world, but also taking it a bit deeper and getting into stuff that we've been talking about related to karma and maybe our soul blueprint and why we're here on earth and all of that stuff. Is that an accurate sort of analogy? I think you did pretty good because okay. yeah, it is hard. It is hard to summarize, you know, so I would say for, to give it, this might help to give a perspective. When I first learned, I felt empowered by human design. It helped me understand, like you said, the essence of like me and the world and who I was. And, you know, I was able to kind of check how I was in alignment. But then after I certified in human design, I wanted to go deeper and I went to Gene Keys. And that is where all the shadow work and the relationship stuff, all of that, I mean, it was, it was, it was a lot. Um, it's, it's a very transformative um, uh, modality. And the other thing I would add, another piece I would add to this would be human design. Um, people tend to kind of fixate more on their individual placements. But the reason why Richard Red calls it the Gene Keys and it's its own unique thing is because it's the belief that whether those numbers are in your chart or not, at some point or another, the planets are going to be transiting and activating that. And you're going to have to go on a personal journey of self-reflection around whatever that gene key is, that topic is. So for example, the gene key one, it's the fullest expression of yang energy. So for approximately uh, six days as you know, the sun activates that collectively, we all will be reflecting on that journey, whether we have that one or not, you know, we're going to be looking at how our life, you know, is in reflection of our desires to bring something new into the world. And, you know, that forward motion, another element of gate one, um, or Gene Keys one, um, is it kind of has this uh, ebb and flow to it, you know, and understanding that there are periods where we might be moving forward and bringing new things and feeling motion, but we also might not. And there's the melancholy can be associated with it, but that embracing and understanding that the melancholy is part of it as well and important to have the breakthrough, you know, and to come to the creative other end of it. So while that's activated, you know, everybody collectively will be, you know, experiencing feeling that essence. So, you know, they can look at, you know, the gene keys and kind of feel out where they are and topics that might be needing to be addressed or in affirmations for things that are going well. Right. So. Right. Awesome. Yeah. I'm very curious about Gene Keys even more now. And maybe I should probably get a reading on that and go back and listen to my human design reading because this is, again, making me very excited about the human design concept and the concept of Gene Keys is very illuminating. So to kind of bring this conversation full circle, because we started off talking about how you grew up in a very religious household and everything was linked to the devil. Now you are a human design reader and Gene Keys guide. So how do you view the concept of the devil now? Do you still believe the devil is a real thing or how have you kind of transformed the idea of the devil in your mind? So I personally, you know, and this is, there were actually, this is something you said um, that I also agree with earlier on. You talked about, you know, everybody's truth being unique and there might not be any one particular path that's, you know, defines everything. So I, I like having this open perspective you know, in uh, understanding how I feel now, but also understanding that might evolve, you know, when, whenever, whatever, 
as it stands now, I would say I don't believe in a devil. Um, I personally feel like I believe in there being an, you know, negative energy. I don't believe in demonic possession. Um, you know, so for me, I feel like as it stands right now, I see that as a fear tactic that kind of contributes to that controlling narrative. Um, but yeah, I, I'd have to say, I, um, I think we're all responsible for our own energetic vibration and that, you know, I'm not seeing it as any particular, uh, demonic entities or Satan that is trying to, you know, possess or consume us. Um, you know, that's where I am today. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's interesting. Cause I could, I can imagine your younger self seeing you being a human design reader and a um, Gene Keys guide and thinking, oh my God, she's you know, doing <laughs> devil work. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I like to end um, every conversation with a fun question, which is really and truly just has your perspective shifted in anything recently? And it could be as lighthearted as now I like mint chocolate chip ice cream, or it could be <laughs> as deep as you want it to be. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm not going to lie. Everything kind of seems generally pretty deep with me. <laughs> I'm always the one that goes in real deep. I love it. I, I would say shifting perspective for me has been, um, I, you know, um, see, and you can see it's still shifting because you hear, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> um, um, but I am being called to speak more, um, into my belief systems regarding galactic astrology and kind of going a little deeper into the essence of who we are in a more multi-dimensional fashion and what our connections are to the stars so it's definitely a topic that um you know is interesting to kind of be coming out more with um but i i've definitely being urged that direction <laughs> okay Cassandra I just think you set us up for a second conversation on the podcast because <laughs> now you just we you just open up the floodgates in my mind what is galactic astrology that is so interesting <laughs> oh my god okay that yeah. is very cool could you tell us what it is at a very high level because I'm sure the listeners might be like what is that yeah. Okay. So simply put, um, part of this whole experience and my awakening journey, one of the first things that happened to me was I had an Akashic record reader tell me where my soul origin, which is soul origin is essentially like where the um, originating point of your essence of who you are, you know, when you're talking about reincarnation, where did that journey begin the very start? Um, and they told me that I was a blueprinter and they said, go by, you know, seek, uh, keepers of the garden by Dolores Cannon and 12th planet by Zacharias Sitchin. And I did, and I put them aside. And then I had another Akashic record reader a few months later. Hey, did you know your soul origin is a blueprinter? And so I was like, okay, you have my attention. Um, so basically I've been spoon fed um, to my level of willingness to accept over the last uh, few years, this concept of basically simply put, you could say star seeds or the idea of that when you go back to the idea of the origin, the God source, whatever it would be, um, splitting off into fragments to experience itself. Part of that is that we have had multiple lives on not just Mother Gaia, this planet Earth, um, and that we have not just here, but galactic um, connections that our soul is connected to. 
um, and experienced lives and, you know, things from other places. And I've especially done a lot of study on ancient Sumer and there are so many other cultures, Native American and other, you know, um, I think Hinduism as well. They have stories in the Vedas of our origins coming from kind of outside of, uh, you know, this planet. So yeah, it's galactic astrology is the study of the fixed stars that reveals past lives in other planets. Cassandra, we have to have you back on the show. It's so <laughs> interesting that you bring this up because I just had a conversation with a guy named Floyd Willis and he wrote a book on ancient um, giants, right? Giants okay. that we hear yep. in the Bible and yep. other accounts throughout ancient history. Yeah, And essentially all of that was kind of connected back to um, aliens, the Galactic Federation. And we also yep. had conversations relating to um, the Anunnaki's from Sumer, like You're all of that. You're speaking my language. Yep. So <laughs> it's interesting that I just had that conversation and I'm supposed to be speaking with someone who is an Akashic Records reader. And we're actually going to go take a deep dive into um, soul blueprints, right? Because yes. she told me my soul blueprint as well. And I was like, what is that? So we're going to take a deep dive into that. So I'm saying it now, we need to have you back on the show because all of this is connected. And I would love to hear more just about the um, the astrology side of it, because that's yeah. really cool. So thank <laughs> yeah. you so much. This was such an amazing episode. I can talk to you for the next two hours, right? So we will, <laughs> again, leave that for part two. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you or get a reading or just connect with you in general? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing I always love to recommend is my podcast. Um, you know, I like I like to talk. It's called Things I Talk About. Um, a lot of the content we've shared here is on my podcast. Um, so that would be the first. The second would be you can check out my website, which is my name, CassandraDeanne.com. And if you are curious about human design, you know, you want to take that first step. I do have where you can pull your free human design chart um, right off of my site and uh, go from there. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for stopping by the show. Thank you. Thank you.